We have wrapped up our study on Ephesians, and this summer we're going to work through some psalms. Obviously, we're not going to get through all of them. There's 150, but we're going to try to tackle uh, eight or nine or so. And so this morning, we're going we're gonna to start that journey. I had the privilege and the opportunity at Dallas Theological Seminary to, to take a class with Ronald Allen. Ronald Allen was passionate about the psalms, written multiple books about the psalms, and there's something about studying with someone who is passionate about what they're doing. It wasn't just an intellectual exercise. I mean, he he loved it. Matter of fact, he'd written several books, and one of them I've been referencing now for some 20 plus years is, and I will praise him. It's a book he wrote on the Psalms, kind of an introduction. I thought I'd read out of the preface just to help us get us started a little bit to hear the, the heart of Ron Allen. He says, at long last, the evangelical church is on the road to recovering the worship of God. Earlier, we had merely assumed worship would happen, that we would come in here and, and get our coffee and drop our kids off, and we'd come and sit in here and just assume that somehow worship would just take place. Surely we thought we would do well if we were involved in evangelism and world missions. Certainly we thought we would do well as we participated in Bible teaching churches. Assuredly we thought we would do well as we reached out to hurting and needy people, and we have done well. Not that we've done all that needs to be done, but we've been about the Father's business. Yet, we had not made much of worship. We did not teach worship in our schools and seminaries. We did not model worship in our congregations. We called the service on Sunday morning the worship service, but we gave little attention to the acts of worship. He says, but things are changing. Christians now gather not just to hear, but also to act not just to be together, but to be together in the praise of God. We will make progress on this road to worship only if we have an adequate guide. And no guide to worship, both personal and public worship, is so fine as the book of Psalms. Public and private worship. Nothing so fine to guide us into worship of God. I'm going to tell you, I sit on that front row and there's nothing more encouraging to me when Jamie backs away from that microphone and to hear you and for us to publicly worship. There have been times, especially that, that song, Abide, I can think about moments where I have, I, that song just been near and dear to me over the last year and thinking, I need to depend on you in my personal time, Right? That's what music does. That's what psalms do. That's what this is. We, we, we worship a living God who created us and wants to be in relationship with us. So I hope that as we work our way through this amazing book and just really scratching the surface, I, I hope it draws you to worship, especially as you hear the different communicators say they share a little bit about what has drawn them to worship. It would draw us to worship. I'm going to try to give a basic overview of the book of Psalms. So if you will, just settle in for a second. I want to make sure we have the basics covered. The first thing we need to do is talk about the title. The word Psalm is clearly uh, doesn't make a ton of sense for us in, in English. It is a transliteration of a Greek word, psalmoi. Now, those of you that know your Bible are probably thinking, wait a minute, I thought the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Why do I have a Greek transliteration of a word for a title of an Old Testament book. Great question. The word psalmoi really means this. It means plucking or uh, bending of a bowstring. We just watched Jamie do it, several other instruments up here, taking on a bowstring. It has this concept of music, poetry, song. That's what the word means in Greek. So we, we know from the Greek title of the book of Psalms that this includes poetry and music. There's also a Hebrew title to the book of Psalms, Telahim, and that means praise. It means praise. So this idea that the Psalms are a book of praise. What I would say is this. We would say that we have a form and a substance. The form of the book of Psalms is po poetry and music and song Whereas the substance of the book of Psalms is praise and adoration. So we know what the, the, the substance is, and we do it in the form of, of poetry. 
I'm going to show you that here in a moment as we look at Psalm 1. Let me give you a few more just kind of overarching things as you think about the book of Psalms. Um, It's broken up into five books, actually. Uh, All 150 are broken up. You can see here, book 1 corresponds to chapters 3 through 41, book book 2, chapters 42 to 72, and so on. When you get to book 5, I might argue that the last four Psalms, 146 to 50, are actually a conclusion, but we'll just throw them all in there to begin with. You might notice that Psalm 1 and 2 are not in book 1, and that's because most scholars believe that Psalm 1 and 2 is actually an introduction to the entire Psalter. Uh, Most folks would also say that these correspond with the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and each one of these books ends with a doxology, this praise to God. And so when you get to the end of the book, you'll see this this doxology that makes much of who God is. So as you read through and you get to Psalm 72, verse 18 and 19, you'll know you've come to the close of book two because there's a beautiful doxology there about who he is. That's kind of how the book is broken down. We're not going to follow any such pattern. The guys are really just saying, hey, what's near and dear to my heart? And we want to preach from that because the Psalms are beautiful in that way. Let me show you some genres, if you will, some some different themes that we have. There's Psalms of praise. There's royal Psalms or messianic Psalms. There's Thanksgiving Psalms, wisdom Psalms. But if you'll notice down there at the bottom, what is the primary genre that you find in the book of Psalms? It's lament. We get this a lot because we live in a sin-cursed world. We live in a world full of pain and hurt and suffering and hardship. And here's the reality. We are going to suffer in this world. The world is is going to bring hardship and pain. And we know from our study of Ephesians that there is an enemy that wants us to suffer. And he doesn't want us to suffer well. He wants us to suffer in a hard giving up on God, mad, angry at God kind of a way. And as we think about this doorway to the Psalms, it's interesting that that we would know that we have a, a God that says, I know the world is wicked and it looks like they're succeeding and it looks like the way of sin is winning. But listen, I am in control and I am here. And you can trust me. Matter of fact, I think we're going to see that in Psalm 1 today. So that's the, that's the basic. There's so much more to talk about. I, I, we could go all day on just an introduction to the book, but this ought to get us started. We're going to start in Psalm 1. So if you've got your Bibles, let me read all six verses to us. Psalm 1, all six verses says this. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He's going to be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. But the wicked are not so. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. When you read a psalm and you read poetry, it, or, or, for some of us, this is a little hard. We just want to you know, hurry up and get to the precepts and what am I supposed to do? But there is a beauty to it. And there's a, there's a cadence to it. And when we read it, I, I hope that we're going to be able to see some of this cadence and the beauty and the imagery that's being painted here. So today, I just thought, instead of me just talking about them, I would try to draw them up here. It's going to be very bad drawing, okay? But um, I'm hoping by the end that we can see on this board Psalm 1 in a visual representation. Okay. As you read it, your first thing we should have noticed were there two, two pictures that were put opposed to each other. One is a tree and the other is 
chaff. One of those is pretty easy. We understand it. And so I'm just going to draw it up here because I think it'd be good for us to, to have it on our mind. And we know that this is planted. There's got some firmness to it. And not only that, but we know this tree is mature. It's grown. We know that because one of the descriptions of this tree is that it has fruit and it bears its fruit in season. It's not young and immature, but it is strong and big. We also know that according to the description, this tree is planted by streams of water. So I'm going to draw some water up here. Now, when you read the Psalms and you read about this tree, there are three descriptions of the tree. He says, not only is it planted and not only is it, is it by the water, but we know this, it bears fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither and all that it does prospers. Now, that's really important. The leaf does not wither. That means it's going to get hot. It's going to get used in summer hot. You with me? It's going to get used in summer hot. And when it gets used in summer hot and the sun is beating down and it is oppressive, what you need to know is that because where this tree is planted, it doesn't wither. It withstands the heat. Now, remember, what was the primary psalm when we read through all the psalms? Lament. And we have a tree here that makes it through and it bears fruit. It has purpose and life. Matter of fact, I'm going to write this up there. Uh, I think it's a word we need to know and associated with this tree. It's the word flourishing. It flourishes. It, it has strength and stability. It is beautiful tree that, that flourishes here. When we think about it, a couple of more words to point out to you. One of them would be, is the word planted. This has the idea that it didn't just an acorn fall off a tree and kind of meander its way down to this supreme spot next to some water. It says it's been planted there. The word planted means that somebody took intentional effort, a master gardener put it in a spot where it would succeed. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Like there's this place that we know we need to be and I'm going to put you in that spot to succeed. The next thing you might think of when you think of that stream is you might just say, oh man, I got my favorite river. I grew up going to the Medina River as a kid in Bandera, Texas. And there was a big tree there with a rope off of it and we'd swing in and it was good times, right? It's actually this, this word streams. Most folks would say this is the idea of irrigation canals, I don't know if you've ever seen orchards or not, but when you take a tree and you want to get fruit off of it, peaches, pecans, I lived in San Saba, Texas. It's the pecan capital of the world. More pecan trees than people in San Saba. I'm a firm believer. And so when you go to an orchard and you see them lined up, you also see these canals between them and they would take water, pump it out of the river and flood those canals so that every tree is near what? Water. Every one of them. And this wouldn't be just something new that we get to say, hey, we figured this out. This would have been true in the ancient Near East as well. They understood flooding and channeling. And so this is the thought that this tree is next to a channel of water so that it can grow and it can flourish and it can bear fruit. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Now, the next picture is a little more foreign to us. It's the idea of chaff being blown away. So try to draw this. Chaff would come off of a head of grain. So I'm going to draw some wheat stalks up here. Um, this is going to be some wheat. It's bad wheat. I know it's bad wheat. This is bearded wheat. So it's got a little beard on it. It's got some grain in the head up here and in the husk. And what we have is this, this wheat or oats or barley, some sort of grain and when you have it, what it does is it grows up and it's green and it's pretty. And then at some point, there's a head on it. And that head is the grain. And once it gets a head on it, the plant dies. You've seen this. It turns brown and it withers away. Now, the reason it does that is because once it dies, everything holding that grain in there becomes weak and fragile. And when you just touch that wheat stalk, the grain begins to fall out because the plant has died. So it's the farmer's job to cut that at the right time where the grain will still hold just for a little bit. 
And then when you hold it in your hand, because the, the head is still, it's, it's, it's a dead plant, you can rub it in your hand and you'll see the husk and the chaff fall out. And what you have when you blow on it is the grain that's left in there. Now, if you've got 100 acres, are you wanting to do this by hand? Not even close. So in the ancient Near East, they would have a threshing floor. You might remember this from the book of Ruth, Gideon. What they would do is they would take a big flat area, typically up in a place where there was some wind, and they would take some oxen, and they would take their grain, and they would put it in there, still in the husk, harvested, and they would march those oxen or those cows around it, and they would trample it and thresh it out. And then they would take a pitchfork and they would grab it, throw it up into the wind and the wind would take out all of the husk and what would fall to the ground? The grain. See the picture here? And so now what we have is this wheat that has been harvested and all that's left is this windblown chaff. Now that's not water, that's wind. And to prove it to you, I'm gonna put a kite right here. I'm sure there wasn't one in the ancient Near East, but, but that, that was it. And then when we think about the key word flourish for the big tree, for the wheat, we're gonna say it's windblown. That's what the text would call it, windblown. It lacks stability. It lacks um, strength. It lacks purpose it's it's nothing all i'm doing is throwing it up into the air watching the chaff go away i don't want to collect it i don't need it it's good for nothing i want the grain and he says there are two pictures here now look at it two pictures and this is what the psalmist wants you to feel right now he wants you to feel this he wants you to gravitate to that picture on the left is that the one you're gravitating toward right now is that the one you ought to be saying, I kind of like the tree better than the, than the chaff. I kind of like bearing fruit thing than, than not having purpose. I kind of like, like flourishing rather than useless. And that's what we have right up front. Now, when you read a psalm, you need to know who the psalm is written to. So some psalms are going to be written to the Lord. Praise the Lord. High and lifted up is his name. Uh, Lord, incline your ear to me. It's written to, to, to God. Some psalms are written to us. Look at this one. Go back to Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man. This isn't about God. It's about who? It's about man. It's about us. He goes on and he says, um, his delight, verse 2. The man's delight is in the law. He will be like a stream. He, the wicked are not so righteous constantly. All of this language in here is about a man. And then we describe the man, either righteous or wicked, and what the man does. And so, since this is about a man, and I think we can put ourselves in the psalm, I'm going to draw a little man down here. And this man's going to have a little bit of a confused face because here we got to figure out which way are we going? Where are we headed? What are we trying to accomplish here? Now, something else is really important about this man. It's a word like. Did you see it before? Tree and chaff. He is like. He is like. There's the comparison. Really important word. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it up here. Because that means you can be like windblown, flourishing. Tree chaff that's what you can be like and when you read this i'm gonna ask you the question what would you like to be like which one do you want to be like and that's the tension in the psalm right now that's what it's asking us that's a beautiful tree it's bearing fruit it's stable it's flourishing there's wind blown oh i'm a man and i want to i want to be like this so guess what question you should be asking now how do I become like the tree? How do I become like the tree? Great question. Glad you asked. Let's look at it. Here it is. You ready? Psalm 1. Go back up to the first. How blessed is the man who does not. I'm going to stop there. Blessed. Um, I got to talk about that word blessed. Really important. 
In Hebrew, there are a couple of words for blessed. One of them is baruch, which is the idea that I bless to give or I bless to attribute. So I say, bless the Lord. I'm attributing praise to you. Or when um, they say, hey, dad, will you bless me? I'm looking for something. Bless me. That's not the word here. This is the Hebrew word ashrei, which means happy. It means the good life. It means satisfied. Satisfied is the man. Happy is the man. The good life is. So because I put, we got wind blown over here, I just, I just need to make sure we know we, we're talking about the good life. Not only that, but because we've also said that this guy is like something Let's figure out what else we've got to see in this passage. This man's going to do some things. In verse 1, it it says what not to do. In verse 2, it says his delight is in the law. Then we get 3 and 4 that tell you what could be. And then when you go all the way down to verse 6, it says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So now we have two descriptions. I got a tree and chaff, but I got righteous and wicked. And then I got this little bitty word that's really important, the way. There's a choice. There's something here. So let me, let me add to my little man down here. What that means is, is there's something that has to be done in order to get to one of these. And I can go windblown or I can go to the good life. And there is a path. There is a way. And we want to know how to get to the tree of life. What is the way to that? How do I have flourishing, satisfaction, happiness, the good life? Back in verse 1, he tells us, he tells us what not to do. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, that seems pretty backwards. You would think he's going to tell you, if you want the good life, you want to be happy, you want to be astray, what you would do is this. But that's not where he starts. He tells you what not to do. He tells you what not to do. Let's look at him. He says, don't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Three sets of two. Let me write them up here, because clearly... The guy that's doing this isn't doing those three, so that would mean those three are leading where? The other side. Now, y'all are good. You're catching on. Here we go. You ready? So we got walk, stand, and sit. Not only do we have walk, stand, and sit, but you're walking with the wicked. You are standing with sinners, and you're sitting with those that mock. And I'm going to put an arrow here because I believe this is a progression. I think this is moving from one set to the next. So uh, let's talk about walking and standing and sitting. Walking with the people who are wicked and sinners and mockers is the idea that I am associated with them. There's an association. I haven't stood and, 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 and hung out. I'm not sitting and eating a meal and like really getting in, but I'm walking with them. I'm hanging out with them. I look at my kids and say, be careful who you walk in the halls with. Guilty by? Like we know it, don't we? It's just the way it works. And so when you're walking there, there's an association. And then when you stand and we want to kind of plant for a minute and we want to talk about it now all of a sudden it's not just association but i'm identifying with you you're my people i'm your people here we are and then when we sit and i pull up a chair and let's hang out and i'm just going to make my home here now it's immersion i am immersed in it this is my life i'm I'm immersed in it How does that play with these three words, wicked, sin, and mocking? Three different words. Um, Let's talk about wicked. Wicked would be the idea that you've done something wrong and you've been condemned for it or judged for it. Uh, For example, I went to Circle K this morning. Let's say I was a little hungry and I thought, you know what? I'm going to use a snicker. I I could use a snicker. uh, Give give me strength through the day, right? And so I'm going to grab it, but I don't have my wallet. I don't have any cash. 
there's nobody here. It's early in the morning. I'm just going to put the snicker in my back pocket. Then they get on the, they get on the, the, the security footage and they see this bald-headed dude early in the morning on a Sunday and they're like, he stole a snicker. And that would be condemned, wouldn't it? Because they would say, he did it. He's guilty. And that's what the word wicked man means. I did something and I was condemned for it. I, I'm judged for it. I, I did this act. Did this act. Now, the word sinner is interesting because it doesn't just have the idea of one time. It has the idea of multiple times. So I, I took the snicker this morning and I'm thinking, dang, I got away with it. I'm going to go to Circle K tomorrow. And guess what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to give me another one. And then two days from now, what am I going to do? I'm going to give me another one. And three days from now, what am I going to do? I'm going to give me another one. And now, no longer am I a one-time wicked. I got caught on the cameras. Now I'm a, a thief. I'm a sinner. It's my identity. That's what I do, right? I'm doing it. I'm doing it constantly. Let's say it's six months down the road. It's early one morning. I grab me a snicker because I've been stealing snickers now for six months. I look up and there's a dude at the cash register and guess what he's paying for? A snicker. And you know what I say to him or about him as I'm walking out? What an idiot. What a fool. Does he not know that you can steal this instead of pay for it? And now what am I doing? I'm mocking him. I'm mocking truth and I'm mocking integrity. I'm mocking character. And that's, that's the way it works. This, this progression of association, identification, immersion to the point of I've done it and now it's me. I'm constantly doing it and to the point where my heart is hard and I look at anybody else not doing it and say, you're all crazy for not doing it the way I'm doing it. Is this starting to sound familiar? Anyone? All right, this is for free. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm gonna give you three more sets of words here. You ready? Three more sets of words. Um, the first time I stole that snicker bar, it would be a compromise. I stole it, I compromised. I didn't think anybody would find out. Um, I know it's wrong, but I really needed a snicker bar. The third, fourth, fifth, sixth time I do it, it now becomes a crutch. Something I do on a regular basis. And then, once it's just who I am and I I'm doing it all the time and I kind of laugh about it and no big deal. Now it becomes a character flaw. How hard is it to fix a character flaw? It's hard, isn't it? I know when you you read the news and you see some massive moral failure from some leader or whatever and we always sit back and we look at this and we think, how in the world did they get here? (laughs) Ask, What was the first compromise? What was the first compromise? What was the first one? I read news this week. um, 81-year-old man was arrested for 11 years of vandalism in his neighborhood. I normally don't click on clickbait. I'm like, I'm reading that. Like, what? (laughs) What? 11 years. 11 years. I mean, he's been taking a slingshot and ball bearings and putting it through windows and denning cars. And I'm like, what? He's now being charged with dozens of accounts, accounts of felony vandalism. And you read that and you're like, 81 years old. I'm like, my dad's 81. Like, I want to ask him, put the slingshot away, right? I'm like, what happened? And here's the deal. This is, this is the question. The question is, what happened the first time? What happened? Did some dude park in front of your mailbox? And you're like, you know what? (laughs) Don't act like that ain't you. Come on now. (laughs) Hits it and he's like, dude, no one found out. They had to pay for it. Let's try that again. Until you get 11 years worth of a character flaw and he's going to serve in prison for the rest of his life. What? What? No one wakes up with that stuff, do they? All right, that's just for free. We got to keep moving. Um, 
What's the next one? You're like, okay, Russell, walk, stand, sit, wicked sin, mocker. How do we get to the good life? How do we get to flourishing? That's what he says in verse two. His delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law, he meditates day and night. He meditates on this law and this law of the Lord is what leads to it. And so we've got a law here. And it's not just any law, it's Yahweh's law. That's what that, those all capital letters mean there. It's, it's Yahweh, the God of creation, Israel's God, the, the God of everything. It's his law, and he says he delights in it. He delights in it. There's happiness, and he doesn't just do that. He meditates on it day and night. This is a bad sun and a bad moon, but that's what it is. We've got meditation, day and night, the law of God. Now, I need to define that word law because it's the word Torah in Hebrew. Now, the word Torah can mean Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and it does sometimes. But sometimes the word Torah is used for Torah of the prophets, the Torah of God, the Torah in other places. So that means this isn't just about the first five books of the Bible, like I'm supposed to just pour over some random laws. It's got the idea of God's guidance, God's will, God's plan, that somebody who wants the good life, someone who wants a flourishing life, someone who wants to, to have stability, sits back and recognizes God's plan is the way to go. If I want contentment and satisfaction, God's way is the way I want. God's guidance is what I'm seeking. And so we have this law of Yahweh and it's a meditation on it day and night. The word meditation literally means mutter or murmur. I want to mutter and murmur and just dwell on it. Have you ever studied something and it just, it's just in your mind constantly? That's what it would be for us, that we would want to know God's plan and I'm, I'm muttering on it and I'm murmuring on it and it brings delight because God's way is good. Paul says it this way in Romans 12, don't be conformed any longer to the way of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what the will of God is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's what it is. I want to murmur and mutter on that because God's will is right. That's what I want to do. And so if I'm headed to flourishing, that's what I would do. By the way, the word delight there and happiness, you can see the tie, satisfaction. Now listen, I'm not telling you, you do this, you're going to get a bigger house and a great car and a promotion. I'm telling you satisfaction, contentment, and delight in the Lord. That's what this looks like. Got to keep moving. Unfortunately, there are consequences. Depending on which path you choose, which way you go, there are consequences. Um, and before I do that, let, let, me, let, me, let me say this. Trees don't sprout up overnight. Big, mature, beautiful, fruit-bearing trees don't, don't, don't pop up overnight. In the same way, you don't develop a character flaw overnight. You don't develop godliness overnight. It's work. Matter of fact, Eugene Peterson says it's, it's long obedience in the same direction. Some of you might be saying, man, I've been at it a month. Come on. Give it another month. And then give it another month. And then give it another year and another year. You find the godliest person you know in here. Take them to breakfast and say, tell me, tell me. How do you have a fruit-bearing life content in God? And I guarantee you somewhere along the way, you're going to hear this. I've been doing this for a long time, walking with Jesus. That's what we got to do. You don't just have a tree pop up overnight. It's long obedience in the same direction. Back to the consequences. Verse 5. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Therefore, in light of all of this, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Um, when you hear the word judgment, many of us think immediately eschatological, like, oh, heaven, hell, eternal state, lake of fire. Is that what we're talking about here? Probably not. That, that's not the way the psalmists think about judgment. But I will say this. Every one of us in this room are going to face some sort of judgment. 
Every one of us in this room. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're going to stand before King Jesus one day. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to lay it all out before him, and it's going to be tested by fire, and it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble, or it's going to be gold, silver, and precious jewels. They're going to line it up there, and he's going to say, where did you spend your life, on the right or the left? What's going to happen? So I know we as Christians are like, whoo, I'm, I'm passing judgment. Yeah, you're not going to be at the great white throne, but you will be at the Bema seat. And I, I don't think that's what the judgment has in here, but that's a, the that's a truth. And if you hadn't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the great right throne is, is reality. That's where we open up the book and see who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Super important. So I, I, just because I don't think that's what this is talking about doesn't mean judgment's not a real thing. So in order to understand what judgment is here, you have parallelisms in the psalm, so you have to probably look at the, the, the second phrase to understand the first one. So the first one says, the wicked will not stand in the judgment or sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Now that's it. So let me ask you this. If you're, if you're a good Hebrew, good Jew, and you're reading your Bible, you're reading this, you would probably think of an assembly as what? going to the temple going to the temple and why would the temple have been so important because that's where the God of the universe chose to meet his people what a privilege what a privilege that the God of the universe would look at his people that he said you are mine Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and I'm going to rescue you from Egypt and redeem you and I'm going to give you this place where you can show up and bring sacrifice and you can come into the presence of almighty God what a privilege isn't it that's the, the assembly and you don't listen don't show up checking off a box don't show up just like well i'm here no 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 no. the sinners don't go into this remember psalm 24 who can ascend the hill of the lord who can come into the presence of god he who has clean hands and a pure heart and doesn't lift up his soul to an idol don't come in here with a hard heart don't come in here with a hard heart don't come in here just going through the motions you're living in wickedness and mocking. And you don't want to come in here with worship and praise. I love the fact that he says they won't stand in the judgment. He uses the same word up here. And he goes, there's no standing. There's no standing. I know we get all bent out of shape in the Old Testament about the law. And we think, man, that was the only way to relate to God. Let me be clear. God has wanted to have fellowship with his people from the beginning. From the beginning. He wants fellowship with you. He wants that we just saying it, abide, like walk with me, trust me, depend. He wants this relationship. And we're over here too busy trying to go at it the way of the world. And he's over here begging, come. And here's the beauty of it. You don't have to go to some place. You don't have to offer up a, a sacrifice. You don't have to go through a priest or a pastor. Guess what? If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are a temple. What? What a thought that, man, I can could, I could walk with Christ and just to, to hit the relationship verse 6 for the Lord knows the way of the righteous that's not knows like determined that's knows in relationship but the way of the wicked will perish man I'm way over time can I read Psalm 2 to you just for fun and then I'll be done? Thank you. Um, I was going to do it anyway, but. <clears throat> Remember I told you Psalm 1 and 2, I think they're tied. Matter of fact, there's not a title on either one of them. So most scholars would say they were probably the same. Acts 13 kind of gives us a hint that this is probably all one Psalm. So let me read it to you. Why are the nations in uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? Which side? The kings of the earth take their stand and their rulers take counsel together. Which side? 
And they're against the Lord and against his anointed. Which side? They're all getting together. And it's against, against, against. And then they say, let us tear the fetters apart and cast away the cords from us. They mock and say, God's way is too harsh and it's too restrictive and it's too hard and I don't want to do those things. That sound familiar, anybody? And the nations have come together to fight against it. Verse 4, but he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And I do believe at this point, they would have all been thinking about a literal king to sit in the line of King David. But all of us after the death, burial, and resurrection, who's this about? I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask me. And I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them with earthenware. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment. Show discernment. Which way are you going to go? What you're doing now is the right side. But I'm going to say... Verse 11, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, and he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. And how did Psalm 1 start? Osre is the man. And how does Psalm 2 end? Osre are all who take refuge in God. Blessing and blessing the world is doing this and it looks like it's winning and God is saying trust me I got a king on the way and after the death burial and resurrection he's saying trust me the king's on the way that's what he's saying in a world of hurt and pain and loss we need to be reminded that the wicked is not winning trusting God and his word that's where satisfaction happiness and flourishing takes place here in a moment we're going to take the elements communion and and you're going to remember the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and as you hold those elements you'll know the price that was paid so that we can enjoy it Matter of fact, I would even go one further. There's only one perfect man who's ever embodied all of Psalm 1, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the perfect man. So when you take it, if those of you who are living on the right side right now, you might sit back and do some confession, because it's incredibly hard to have fellowship when you're not confessed, and you haven't said, I'm sorry, and you haven't sought forgiveness. Those of you who call Faith Bible Church home if you'll lead us here. We've got some tables in the back of each section. We'll go out the right. You'll come and get the elements. You'll go back into your row to the left. In the back, you'll start back there. In the front, you'll start up here. And then um, you take the elements on your own. Spend some time praying. Take the elements. And then when you're ready, we'll stand and we'll continue to worship. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, your, your word is rich and it is good. And, um, yeah, it's just rich and good, because you are. You, um, you provide, you give yourself to us. You give yourself to your son Jesus. You, you give yourself through your word. You give yourself through your presence, the Holy Spirit. And I confess, Lord, that there's so many times I just want to stand and walk and sit in the world instead of meditate and murmur and mutter your word and your will. I swear it's good, Lord. Thank you for the good life. Thank you for the flourishing. Help us to live in it. As we, as we hold these elements, I pray that your, your son Jesus is honored. His sacrifice gratefully accepted and as these psalms call us to worship I just pray these, these last few songs that we sing we would 
we wouldn't just sing them with our mouth, but we'd sing them with our heart. We love you. It's in your son's name. Amen. You can go and begin to